for introduction, and I also would like to thank you, the organizers, for giving me opportunity to speak at this beautiful and somewhat humbling venue. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the recent advances and opportunities and challenges of robotic perception, and I'm going to mostly focus on visual perception, but some of the some of the topics also apply to other sensing modalities. So we are in a really exciting times. We have um, autonomous cars sort of collecting more and more data and sort of hopefully getting ready for, for giving some rides. Uh, we have uh, quadrotors navigating difficult terrain in real world settings. We have uh, uh, robot manipulators uh, grasping uh, previously unseen objects at, uh, at greater speeds than ever. And to some extent, many of these advances are sort of facili facilitated by better computational model, more computational power and speed, and of course, um, larger availability of data. So in computer vision in uh, around 2012, there was sort of a little bit of a revolution started by um, introducing computational models for image classification, which sort of suddenly outperform all the previous approaches by a significant margin. And this was to a large extent uh, enabled by the availability of large label data sets. And this was in particular in ImageNet, which had 14 million images with about 20K classes. And the initial problem which uh, researchers looked at was image classification, but this was sort of later extended to the problems of object detection, where not only categories of uh, objects were predicted, but also their location in images. And then subsequently, a couple of years ago, there were sort of new challenges introduced, and the most common one is this common object in context data set which has around 330K objects of about 80 categories. And since then, since 2012 and, and 15 and so on, more and more architectures have been introduced and the performance kept on growing. So for many of us who are interested in robot perception, we, you know, our research is motivated by this vision that we would like to have uh, robotic agents um, coexisting with humans in these home environments, which are real-world environments, cluttered with lots of objects dispersed randomly, and perhaps somewhere in the future, we would like to have these capabilities where we can get some home helpers, which would help us with um, doing some tidying tasks and putting things in, object in, in the right places. So in order to enable this, in order to have perceptual capabilities, we need to be able to recognize and identify objects which we typically encounter in this household environment. So, so the good news for the robotics is that these current very powerful models are indeed very, very fast. So even though the training um, is quite costly, it is not uh, uncommon to be able to run these models at uh, you know, 50 frames per second on a powerful computer, but the performance uh, um, and the accuracy is sort of reasonable for, for deployment in the real world setting. The difficulty, however, is that majority of the classes which these pre-trained detectors on this uh, very large labeled data set can detect, only some of the classes are really relevant for, for the type of tasks we might be interested in. So despite of the fact that the COCO data set significantly diversified the kind of categories we can detect with uh, sort of fairly high accuracy, many of the type of objects we might be interested in manipulating are simply at the very sort of uh, end of that spectrum or they do not even appear in this data set. So in order to really take advantage of the power of these uh, powerful computational models, we have a big difficulty of needing to actually gather sufficient amounts of training data. And so this is sort of something which we 
sort of undertook uh, to make some headway with uh, a couple years ago. We have collected several data sets, and this was a data set uh, with, um, of uh, various household objects in, in kitchens. We have sort of various uh, amounts of clutter. These were graduate students' kitchens. We had uh, collected these uh, dense data sets where uh, we had various objects which were part of the data sets used in manipulation randomly dispersed in the environment. And so the labeling of this data set was in fact uh, sort of not uh, too difficult in the sense because we used sort of the standard structure from motion techniques to register all the views, labeled the objects of interest in the 3D, and then projected back the labeling in the individual frame. So that gave us some amount of uh, training data, but it was still not sufficient in order to be able to train these powerful object detectors. So we were looking at uh, techniques how we can generate larger amounts of training data in order to be able to obtain um, sort of uh, satisfactory performance in these settings. And so what we have done is we have uh, taken our scenes and we have also taken um, the scans or the meshes of other data sets, uh, other research groups uh, collected. In this particular case, it was the Big Bird data set, which has both 3D point clouds and images available. And we have taken, sort of refined the segmentation mass of these objects, and then we have used sort of computer graphics techniques for image compositing for and, and place these objects into our backgrounds, and this enabled us to generate significant number of training examples in an automatic way. And here are some examples of the images where the objects are actually synthetically composed into the scenes. And so this method was effective, and uh, we managed to increase the performance of the state-of-the-art detectors uh, in, in about, uh, I guess, 10, 12 uh, percent. And there have been some follow-up works along these lines which have so also demonstrated that using some more sophisticated blending techniques and multiple types of blending techniques, one can actually train models which are not sensitive to the blending artifacts. Another thing which was very important to use very kind of aggressive data augmentation methods in order to be able to detect uh, objects which have um, large amounts of occlusions and clutter. And while in our setting we have used the object meshes and, and the images associated with this, some other groups were also successful in demonstrating that this kind of training mechanism is successful even in settings where you use textured CAD models. So there is this sort of whole line of work where there are a lot of efforts in collecting 3D models of objects, which are just CAD models. And if there are texture map, these detectors can be successfully trained with this synthetic data. So, so, so this leaves us in the following setting. So we'll, we'll adopt these detectors, and we will have them sort of uh, mechanism where we will train a deep network and the deep network will generate bounding boxes and per bounding box, which is the location of the object, will have a vector of probabilities which will um, sort of represent the confidences of different, different categories. So for small number of objects, this is sort of a doable uh, strategy and the previous effort demonstrated how to generate training data with relatively um, uh, low cost in order to train these detectors. However, this is sort of unlikely to scare to thousands of categories, and we may have need to be able to not only recognize and detect a variety of object instances, but we also would like to have a capability to be able to add new instances to the, to the pile of objects without the need of having to retrain these models because the training process sort of requires the generation of training examples and so forth. So, so what we, were, we wanted to do is to rethink a little bit this object detection um, pipelines and make it a little bit more relevant for the robotic settings. So in the robotic settings, instead of given an image and needing to ask, 
what are the probabilities of all possible objects uh, which, uh, which you have trained your detector on, you may be interested in actually localizing particular objects. So I would like to ask, well, given the serial box, can you please tell me, generate some hypothesis where the serial box is in the, in the image? So we have termed this approach so-called target-driven instance detection. So, so the question is, how can we find these objects and images? And so here in this approach, we, we take advantage of the, of the power of convolutional neural network, which has been already demonstrated in classification and detection setting. But instead of formulating it as a classification problem, we are going to try to formulate it as a matching problem. So namely, we'll take the, let me see whether I can point on the slide. We are going to take the, the target image which we are looking for, and we are going to take the scene image, and we'll compute some embedding, feature embedding, by using some common set of features computed through the convolutional layers. And then, given these embeddings, we'll form a new layer, which is a correlation layer, which is basically characterizing for each location in the image what is the similarity between the embedding of the object and that location. And that is then followed by additional convolutional layers, which are then the layers where the anchor boxes and bounding box regression is being carried out. And so if we look at this, and th this is a uh, work uh, of myself and my collaborators, and it was led by, by Phil Amirato from University of North Carolina. And so if you look at our architecture, if we have a scene instead of the standard object detection architecture, which generates, uh, if you look at the region of proposal layer, of the, of the faster RCNN, you will generate a lot of hypotheses. In our case, the layer at which we are proposing the bounding boxes has sort of clear um, uh, high activation layers at the places which correspond to the objects which we are looking at. And this is also to, to sort of highlight a little bit the difficulty of the task. So this is something which would be impossible to do using the standard hand engineer uh, feature matching techniques. And you can think of them, so the, we, we have some numbers in comparing the, the traditional feature-based methods. And so conceptually, you can think of, uh, of this method as a template matching technique, except the template matching is basically happening in this uh, learned embedding space, which um, uh, which is sort of uh, done separately for the image and the template. So we have about 50% accuracy on maybe around 30 objects which are placed in these household environments in sort of rather difficult um, uh, conditions with a lot of clutter, lighting variations, and large variations in scales. So this is, so where are the remaining uh, 45 or 49% which you would like to get? So, so the difficulty is that some of these placements are indeed very, very difficult. And it's just simply not possible to, detec to detect these objects, partly due to large amounts of occlusions or due to the very small re resolution of the objects. And sometimes it's also due to the fact that there are a lot of ambiguities between different instances of the object. So the natural thing which we can think of as robotics as well. We should use some active strategies. We can move and generate new viewpoints and maybe get closer to the objects in order to be able to um, sort of generate new hypotheses. And here, this idea is conceptually demonstrated here at the bottom, so I may be interested in detecting coffee maker, but at the beginning, uh, I, my confidence that there is a coffee maker in that bounding box is only 0 0.4, but if you move closer, uh, you can um, dramatically improve your detection. So this problem of active perception and active vision has been tackled uh, many times in the past. And, but the problem with the active vision is that if you need to generate an action, this action is typically generated by a robot who needs to move. 
And that typically happens in your lab and in the, in the environment wherever you are carrying out your experiments, where the, the amount of realism you have in that environment is sort of quite far removed from what the actual environments will look like. And it's also very hard to repeat these experiments, right? So, uh, so everybody will have their own platform, own environment, so it's really difficult to compare uh, these different methodologies. So in order to um, sort of overcome some of these difficulties, we have collected another data set, and the data set was collected with the mindset of enabling this repeated rep, repeated experiments and proper benchmarking for this sort of active recognition strategies. So, so the idea of the data set was that we have basically taken uh, several household environments. These were one, two bedroom apartments. And we have very densely scanned the environment such that about every 30 centimeters, we have taken 12 views of uh, the RGB scans of the scene, so we have a higher resolution RGB image and the depth map associated with the scenes. So here are some uh, visualization of the environment. This was uh, again led by Phil Amirato at UNC. And given the entire collection, we have used um, again the structure from motion techniques where we have globally registered all the views. So as a result, we have uh, densely scanned views, and each view has an observation associated with it, which is the high resolution image and the depth map. And here are some examples of the 3D reconstructions of the environments which we have. And then we have the bounding boxes labeled um, of these objects instances in these environments. To give you some uh, quick look how these environments will look like, is there are different layouts, different sizes. And uh, the views are all taken 35 uh, centimeters apart, so there is a grid. So to highlight the difficulty of the object detection problem, here is a small diagram or a heat map which is plotting the confidences of the detector as a function of viewpoint. So the, the pink diamond corresponds to the location of the object, and the dots in the diagrams correspond to the confidence to confidences of the detector when the camera is placed at the particular um, locations in the image. So you can see that there are only particular viewpoints where the detector is really confident, while the remaining viewpoints, when you move further away, the confidence is extremely low. But even when you are close, if the object is occluded, you simply cannot tell. So this is just sort of highlighting the need for these active techniques. So we have made some very preliminary and initial efforts to actually learn the strategies, how to move the camera in order to improve the confidences of the detectors. And this has been simply done by training a separate classifier to categorize objects and use the confidence score as a reward for, for, for the reinforcement learning algorithm. And uh, we, uh, the algorithm proceeded by sort of running for five step episodes where either the episode finished after five steps or it finished when the confidence of the detection um, was about 0.9%. So here are a couple visualizations of the strategies learned by this active recognition system and as it enabled after a few steps correctly recognize the objects. Now this was sort of a simplified version of the system because we actually passed the bounding boxes to the system. So this was just a matter of figuring out how to move to increase the confidences. So it was not fully integrated with the detector. So I'm gonna just quickly fly through another module. So we have also taken some of the state-of-the-art semantic segmentation techniques, which enable us to gain the semantic understanding of the remainder of the environment, the non-object categories, which are wall, walls, floors, support surfaces, and other uh, categories, and uh, show that you can actually train uh, the network simultaneously 
with, while trying to estimate the depth of the scene and doing this jointly using some multitask learning framework, we can um, share the lower level features of this deep convolutional network and achieve the increased uh, accuracy. And I'm not gonna go through the technical details, but here are some results of uh, both the initial images, the ground truth segmentation, and the predicted um, depth maps and the predicted semantic segmentations. So you can argue that it's maybe not necessary to predict the depth maps, but this was also very effective to uh, technique for being able to overcome some of the difficulties of the depth sensors, which simply do not return any values at, at certain places. And having being able to do it jointly with semantic segmentation really helped. So we have now these powerful semantic representations. We know how to detect objects, and we can uh, estimate per pixel labeling of scenes. So, so how, can we, how can it help some other tasks? So there have been several efforts using these um, basic modules for building 3D semantic models of the environment. And lately, and I guess we've probably seen a couple papers here, but there are a few more papers coming in uh, upcoming CVPR conference, is how to use these representations for better localization. So clearly, this is much richer representation, which can um, help overcome some of the difficulties and ambiguities of, of the localization. And so, so if you would like to now, so the question is, if we were to use these representations for navigation, one avenue to pursue would be to simply build a map, and we can build a semantic map, and while we are building, building this map, we can use these powerful techniques for localization, and once we have the map, we can take the, the planning module and plan the path in the map, and that can be followed by the control module, and uh, we can then sort of achieve our goals. So I'm not gonna go in detail through the difficulties of this sort of multi-stage approach, but what we were sort of interesting, interested in exploring, whether we can in fact learn these navigation strategies while bypassing this mapping, uh, planning, and control uh, problem. So this would be an example of an end-to-end -end learning, and it was sort of mostly trying to understand how these richer semantic representations can enable uh, this learning task. So, so the problem we, we set forward to, to study is this problem of target-driven navigation. So this is a problem that you are in the environment and you are asked to go to a certain target. And you do not have the map of the environment, you, you do not know where you are in the environment, and the question is, can you, with sufficient number of experience, learn a navigation strategy which will guide you in the right way to find the target? Okay, so the, the canonical task which we are showing here is the robot is said, go to the refrigerator, and, uh, and at the end, we would like to, we have a mechanism how to learn the strategy to do so, and I'm gonna discuss that in a second. So what we have done is that instead of learning this end-to-end -end strategies, as it has been done previously directly from pixels, we have taken these rich semantic representations, such as semantic segmentations, object detectors, and the depth maps, and we have learned the common embedding of these, so we pass them through several of these convolutional layers in the sort of a typical feature extraction convolutional layers such that these join uh, modalities and representations were kind of put together into some joint embedding, which is some vectorial representation of that observation, which collects the, um, the relevant pieces of information from these different modalities. And then this uh, embedding was followed by several of these decision layers. And in the first um, setting, we have just had a very simple feed-forward architecture, which was then later augmented using some recurrent neural network model. Uh, so what this uh, network was trying to learn is 
to estimate for a particular target you are looking for to estimate the value of each action. And the value of the action in this case was obtained using a supervised setting because we were training this network in our Activision dataset environment. So given an initial position, we can compute the shortest path to the goal. So for each location, we know what is the optimal action to take towards the goal. And so we have successfully trained the network. And here is some visualization of, of, of the strategy. So what you see are basically the values of the action estimated by the network, which is trying to reach the TV, which is in the back of the room. And uh, while the, the stop actions basically indicate uh, do not go there because there will be a collision, then the, the red cross action indicate these are bad actions because this would in fact put me further away from the goal, so the action to take would be the one to go around the table. So, so if we take this strategy and evaluate it on our environment, here are the following observations. So, so if we take the environments which we have trained on, we usually have two scans of the environments where the layout is the same, but positions of certain objects change. We can achieve very high accuracy even just using the images and the depth maps. So the agent basically learns how to navigate. And, but as long as the environment is completely different, then the accuracy drops significantly. However, when we start using the semantic segmentation and object detectors uh, as modalities, the, the, the accuracy increases. Now, in our training setting, we had very small amounts of training data, and so we also sort of studied how to improve this using large amounts of data. And so in our case, as an auxiliary source of data, we in fact use simulated environments. So we used the Sun CG data set, and, and this is a data set which is visually non-realistic data sets of household environments with realistic layout, but the visual realism does not, um, uh, it's sort of far removed from, from what we encountered in real worlds. But because of our representation, we could easily reuse the, um, we can use, we can, since the representation is the input into our training, uh, into our module, we didn't have to do any adaptation and we could basically compute the same kind of representations from sim simulated environments and then have demonstrated that, that this uh, sort of dramatically improves the performance in the previously unseen scenes. So, where does it leave us? So why we are doing this navigation using, wh why is it interesting to learn these policies in this end-to-end -end setting? So it turns out that the, if we compare it with the strategy where you actually go and randomly explore the environment and when the detector detects the objects, it computes the shortest path to the object, it turns out that this strategy actually outperforms that random exploration plus object detection strategy. And the object detection strategy on the top of it is actually using the knowledge of the environment how to find the shortest path. Um, the paths are far from optimal, so if you measure the, the path length ratio, which is the length of the path compared to the optimal path, it's um, still significantly longer than what the optimal part could have been achieved. So this is just some initial exploration in uh, both using these richer representations for navigation and uh, also sort of mechanism how to evaluate it in the context of this uh, data set. So I will leave it here. Uh, I think this is a very exciting field to be in. I think there are a lot of opportunities in robotics to, to tackle the problem of lack of training data by using various self-supervision strategies. This can be self-supervision via motion, via action, language, or interaction. Um, 
I think, you know, this is important for, I think, robotics community to more think about how to adapt and specialize particular strategies to specific environments, which is often sort of a different objective to the computer vision community, where the, the goal is to generalize to previously unseen environments. And we'll, the learning will stay with us. We'll need a lot of data. We'll still need a lot of computing power. Um, simulators, I believe, will continue to be used, and we'll have better simulators to, to train some of these techniques and to be able to also generate these repeatable experiments. And we should really strive to have representations which are reusable between various tasks. So this is a kind of a thought given to, to some of the previous um, uh, sort of speculations which uh, were sort of put forward, whether we should have end-to-end -end learning everything and so forth. Um, and I, I think it's very important to try to embrace this um, sort of attitude of being able to do repeatable experiments with the right kind of benchmarks so we can sort of understand better what works and not. And I just would like to thank you all my students and collaborators, both at UNC uh, and at Google Brain. And this is, these are the papers which most of this work was based on. Okay, thank you. Couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, hi. Um, thank you for your very insightful talk. Mm -hmm. um, can you? Uh, please detail a little bit what you mean or what you see can be, how can it be done? Self-supervision via language. I mean, so you can imagine, for example, that, uh, you know, there is some generic notion of an object which uh, kind of appears uh, in this sort of la lower layer of networks, the region proposal networks, where there are really no labels assigned to the objects. So we can imagine s techniques where while the, the robot is interacting with some objects, some language stream is being uh, sort of recorded at the same time, and some correlations are trying to be discovered of what nouns may correspond to the language. There's, I mean, to the objects. Uh, so this requires some thought of how to set up an extensive experiment in order to gather this type of data. But I think that this is definitely the case how babies and humans learn. So they, you know, have a lot of interactions with a very small number of labels, right? So you can imagine the child is playing with an object and there is only one time the, you know, the, uh, the label is actually uh, named. And there are also some efforts along these lines in navigation using natural language instructions. So this is again an effort where you can use the power of this natural language uh, processing pipelines and trying to sort of understand it jointly with some navigation strategies which would not only help you to navigate better, but also hopefully learn more about the objects you encounter in the environment. Thanks. Mm -hmm. One quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so, so would, and I think you've done also a lot of work with these RGBD cameras, mm -hmm. right? And, and everybody, of course, in the world is very excited about them. But they have these, these very annoying limitations, for example, very limited field of view, the resolution isn't actually that high, mm -hmm. and when things get too close, then you don't get depth information at all. Um, do you feel like now also maybe building more of these uh, deep learning into these systems that we might be able to at some point get away without depth cameras and just do it with monocular or stereo systems? So I... However you get the depth, I feel the depth is important. And I also feel that the high quality depth is important. 
And this is also something we have observed in some of these navigation experiments. So if you get the ground truth depth from the simulation, this dramatically improves the performance. Right, so, so I think, however, right, whether you will learn better depth maps, whether you have better stereo algorithms to estimate the depth maps, or whether you have better depth sensors, I, I think depth is really important, whether you estimate it or whether you have a sensor to measure it, yeah. All right, thanks again. Okay, thanks. Yeah.